Jake's dad brought him a dog hoping the animal would help his paralyzed son. What happened next left everyone in shock. Krusty, the border collie, woke up just after midnight, knowing something was seriously wrong. He peered onto Jake's bed and immediately knew the situation was life or death. Krusty dashed to the bedroom door. In his doggy heart, he knew if he didn't get help fast, Jake would die. Jake was a special kid. Now in his teens, he hadn't had an easy start in life. He had his first stroke when he was only 15 days old. And this medical event changed everything about the route his life would take. For the first four years of his life, Jake struggled with weakness on one side of his body. Some doctors called the condition hemiplegia. Others used the more common name, unilateral palsy. Because of this condition, it took Jake longer to walk than other kids. He was partly paralyzed. Jake was also tired most of the time. He had behavioral challenges, and mostly because he was frustrated at not being able to do and experience what other kids did. And then came nursery school. Things just got worse. He took longer to learn new skills, and he still needed help to get dressed and go to the bathroom. At school, he got into trouble because he really had a hard time focusing. Eventually, completely at their wit's end, Jake's parents decided to follow the doctor's advice and get Jake a dog. The dog was never intended to be a service dog, though. It was just going to be a friend and companion, someone he could trust. Krusty had been on the streets for three years now. This morning, he flipped his food route around. There were many cars on the road already, and this told him Mr. Dunwoody, the butcher, would be open already. Krusty liked the butcher. The man was always kind, and whenever Krusty popped in, Mr. Dunwoody spoiled him with sausages. Krusty was hungry. For the past two days, he'd been eating from garbage bins. His meandering had taken him to the other side of town. He had no specific reason for going there, but Krusty was looking for something. That much his canine mind understood, but he didn't know what it was. All he knew for sure is that he would recognize it when he saw it. Mr. Dunwoody spotted the dog the moment he walked into the butcher shop. Good morning, boy, the butcher said with a broad smile. You haven't been in for a couple of days. Where were you? And Krusty sat before the long counter, his head tilted to one side, ears cocked, and listening carefully to every word the kind man said. He understood nothing, though. His eyes were fixed on the theatrical manner with which the butcher was selecting his treats for the day. What about a string of sausages? The butcher asked and winked. Freshly made. Minced the meat myself. It's my secret recipe, you know. Mr. Dunwoody placed the sausages on the counter, grabbed a bowl, and then disappeared into the meat display again. Through the glass front, Krusty licked his lips as he watched the butcher shovel three handfuls of chopped meat into the stainless steel container. Krusty thumped his tail harder. He knew this game. The butcher would call Krusty into the back and leave him alone with the food until he was done. It was the one perfect meal of the week, and Krusty couldn't wait. Jake's parents weren't sure where to start the search for a companion dog for their son, and they had no idea what kind of dog would be right for the boy. Should they get a great big old dog or something small? Something fat and lazy or an active, energetic dog? They just didn't know. Ethan, Jake's dad, grabbed his coat and headed for the door. He turned to his wife, pecked her on the cheek, and said, I won't be long tonight. The meeting should be short. I'll see you before 10. She asked if he remembered what he had promised. He nodded and hugged her. When they had decided to get Jake a dog, he promised his wife that he would put the word out at the next club meeting. If nothing else, one of his fellow board members might have some good advice. Ethan sat at the head of the long boardroom table at the Porcupine Creek Golf Club in the foothills of the Santa Rosa Mountain. He counted his fellow board members as they walked in. Jack Kinnear owned a statewide chain of hardware stores. Henry Stubbs was the CEO of the local accountancy firm. Seven other men arrived after them, all taking their places at the table, and the meeting started. When it was done, shortly before nine, Ethan talked about his son. They all knew him and liked the boy. Ethan asked for their advice about the type of dog they should get. At the other end of the boardroom table, Mr. Dunwoody, the club's secretary and local butcher, listened carefully. An idea sprouted in the back of his mind. It hadn't formed properly yet, but he believed it was a good one. Heck, no, it was a great idea. On the way out the door, he took Ethan's elbow and pulled him aside. Don't do anything about the dog just yet, Ethan. I may have just the canine for you, he said. But I'll need a few days to set it up. 
It took Krusty three days before he headed to the butcher shop again. On each of those days, Mr. Dunwoody had watched the door anxiously. His plan was now fully formed. Krusty was a fantastic dog. He was bright as a button, gorgeous to look at, a happy-go-lucky chap, and didn't have a mean hair on his head, regardless of how life had treated him. The butcher remembered the first time he'd met Krusty. He wanted to adopt him on the spot, but his wife had severe asthma, so that was never going to be an option. On that day, the dog was looking slightly worse for wear. He was friendly, but a bit skittish. Mr. Dunwoody immediately assumed that Krusty had a home once upon a time, but that things went wrong somehow and that the dog had ended up on the streets. As soon as Krusty came into his shop, Mr. Dunwoody waddled around the counter and sank to his haunches. Still speaking to him as if he were a human, the butcher said, We have to talk, boy. Big stuff. I think I have a new home for you. Of course, Krusty couldn't understand a word, but he tilted his head and cocked his ears anyway. The butcher selected a few sausages, some liver, and chopped steak for Krusty, mixed it in the bowl and took the dog through to the packing room in the back. He closed the door softly behind him and headed straight for the telephone. Jake's dad answered on the third ring. Falling over his words from all the excitement, Mr. Dunwoody explained about the dog, and that he was in the butcher shop, and that Ethan had to get Jake and come down immediately, and then he sang Krusty's praises for what seemed like an eternity. Emily, Jake's mom, was surprised to see her husband back home so early in the morning. He explained about the dog. Initially, she was suspicious about the dog, it being a stray and all, but she eventually agreed to let their son meet the dog, provided it was properly supervised. After all, the butcher had known and loved the dog for three years. An hour later, Jake and his parents walked through the doors of the butchery. Mr. Dunwoody made some unnecessary small talk and kept an eye on Jake. The longer it took, the more excited the boy got. He leaned on his crutches and was way too polite to interrupt the grown-ups while they were talking, but everything in his posture screamed that they should stop talking already and show him the dog. Eventually, after dragging the whole affair out for another five minutes, Mr. Dunwoody turned to Jake. Do you want to meet the mutt, Jake? He asked with a wink. Without waiting for the boy to answer, Mr. Dunwoody opened the door to the back of the butchery. Krusty had finished his bowl of meat, then a bowl of water, and another bowl of different meat. He was a little confused. Mr. Dunwoody always treated him well, but today was extra special. The dog couldn't remember when he had had so much to eat. When the door remained shut, even after he'd finished wolfing down the feast, Krusty had become a little edgy. He didn't like to be confined. It reminded him of really bad times and the closed door made him feel trapped. So when Krusty walked into the store, he was a little unsure. He often came out after his meal when there were customers in the store, so encountering strangers wasn't an issue for him. But these people looked different. Krusty immediately liked Ethan. The man had a warm smile on his face, but it's nothing compared to how he felt when he looked at Jake. It was a boy, a teenager, and in that moment Krusty knew what he'd been looking for on the streets for so long. He knew what it was that his heart was pushing him to find. It was this boy. Without hesitating, Krusty headed straight over to Jake. His tail did a helicopter imitation, and he pushed his nose into Jake's open hand. By this time, the boy was on his knees and pulling the dog's head into his neck. It took less than 30 seconds for Jake to turn to his parents and say, This is the dog, Mom. Dad, this is the dog I want. Can we take him home now? This was the point where Mr. Dunwoody intervened. With a solemn face, he said, It's not all that simple, Jake. Krusty doesn't belong to me, and I'm sure he'll want to have a say in whether he goes home with you or not. Jake was undeterred. How do we do that? he asked. Mr. Dunwoody winked at Jake's dad. Pull the car around, he said. Park in front of the shop. If Krusty jumps in of his own volition, he's made his choice. That night was the first night that Jake had company in his room. It was like the excitement he only felt the night before Christmas. Neither Jake nor Krusty slept a wink. Krusty explored every nook and cranny of his new home, and eventually hopped on Jake's bed and created a nest at the boy's feet. For the next six years, this was the nightly picture in the household. The boy happily drifting into dreamland, forgetting all the problems he had to face in his young life, being comforted by his best friend Krusty the Border Collie. Until tonight. Krusty looked over his shoulder again and saw Jake wasn't doing well. 
He jumped and managed to get the bedroom door open. He dashed down the hallway into Jake's parents' room, and with one fluid movement, he launched himself on top of them. Both Jake's mom and dad immediately realized something bad was happening. Without waiting for them, Krusty ran full speed down the hallway. He waited for a split second at Jake's door just to make sure they were following and disappeared inside. The ambulances arrived ten minutes later. Ethan grabbed Krusty by the collar to get him out of the paramedic's way while they were stabilizing Jake. Then they carried the boy down the stairs on a gurney. Jake's parents followed them outside but locked Krusty in the house first. In the car, Emily cried and prayed at the same time. Ethan reached over and squeezed her hand. He was frowning and his heart was thumping in his chest. The doctors had been warning them for years. This was about the age where they would have to be really vigilant. Jake had a stroke as a newborn. Now, as a teenager, there would be a window where he could have a second and if he did, it could have dire consequences. But things had been going so well with Jake's health, especially since Krusty had joined the family, that their concerns had all but dissolved. The wait at the hospital was the worst. Jake was wheeled straight into the emergency room, and his folks made themselves at home in the waiting area. For more than an hour, they didn't get to speak to a doctor or a nurse. Panic was rising in both of them. The human mind has a hard time coping with not knowing, and both of them were experiencing that in spades. Finally, after what seemed like an eternity, the doctor appeared. He spoke to one nurse briefly and gave another a clipboard and a whole set of instructions. Then, slowly and solemnly, he walked over to Jake's parents. There are still some tests to run, he stated, but his prognosis is good. In fact, not good, it's excellent. You managed to catch the stroke minutes after it started. I don't know how you did it, but that undoubtedly saved your boy's life. When Emily asked if Jake would make a full recovery, the doctor smiled. Again, you caught it before it could do a world of damage, and he got to the hospital in record time. Yes, he will recover fully. The physician frowned again, then said, I'm curious how you caught it so quickly, though. It's the middle of the night. Usually when this kind of thing happens in the small hours, people don't realize it until morning, and in most cases, by then, the damage is done. After Ethan explained what had happened, the doctor smiled. You should keep that dog hip-deep in prime steak for the rest of his life. Your son survived because of him. What an incredible story about how humans and animals care for each other. Do you know of someone whose life was saved by a dog? If so, tell us your story in the comments. We'd love to hear it. For now, though, we're out of here. Catch you in the next video.